This program is brought to you by Emory University. So this is our annual device talk, everybody. Um, I will, uh, we, we have a little bit more than usual information to cover. So I'm gonna try to go through and make it as, as interesting as, as a device talk can be. Um, I do, uh, you know, I was just telling Dr. Bot, I, I do think it's important that it's interactive. So please, if I'll, I'll ask you guys questions along the way, please answer, or, you know, I know, I know some people are at home. I hear their dogs and babies back there, but please answer. Thanks. All right. So the, for the, you know, we just got done with the board review EKG thing. Uh, this is not meant to address any of the EKG interpretations of the boards. Uh, for as far as devices are concerned, there's a very small portion uh, on the EKGs that have to deal with devices. It's really uh, mindless stuff, um, and that will be very easy for you. Uh, we will go over one feature, and that is recognizing a by paste QRS morphology. But other than that, this, we're not going to talk about coding. All right, what we will talk about, though, is basic device function. How to identify device and in your real life, figuring out what type of device uh, is in somebody is really the most important thing. You can infer programming based on that, and you can really troubleshoot things based on that. So device identification. We'll talk about sensing and capture issues, and then uh, finish on some erratic behaviors of pacers and other implantable devices. Basic pacer function. Uh, this is one of those things that the more you learn, the less you, uh, less you really know. The more you know, you, the more you think you know, uh, the more you, you understand that it's incredibly complicated. What I think you should be responsible for is knowing what a lower rate limit is, and that is the distance between the subsequent pacing spikes of uh, uh, the atrium or ventricle or the distance between a pacing spike and the last sensed event. There's a lower rate limit, and that'll really help you determine if there are too few or too many pacer spikes than expected. And that's how we divide troubleshooting up. There's an upper rate limit. If there's a sensor, meaning that fourth letter rate responsive, so it'll drive the pacing rate up to an upper rate limit. There's a programmed AV delay in DDD or dual chamber pacemakers. And there's a post ventricular atrial refractory period. This is the time where the atrium will not be acted upon after sensing a ventricular event, PVAR. And there's, uh, this is relevant to one erratic pacer function that we'll uh, finish our lecture with. So here's the NBG code for pacing. This should all be reviewed for everybody. The first letter stands for the chamber's pace. So it's either gonna be A, V, D. Sometimes you'll see S, which is just generic for single chamber, but you see it's A, V, or dual. The second letter stands for the chamber sense. So is it sensing in the A, is it sensing in the V, or is the sense amplifier program so that it's sensing both? And then finally, the third letter. And the third letter is the most important. And that is the response to sense activity. So most of the time you'll see D, but D stands for triggered and inhibit. So what, what it's, it's a combination of triggered and inhibit. So when it's DDD, it will trigger the V when sensing an A, but inhibit the V when sensing the V. So that's why there's a D there. You can see AAI or VVI pacemakers, you guys know those uh, programming modalities. And this is just single chamber pacing with an inhibit if it sees something. So it resets the pacing clock when it sees something. Uh, the fourth letter is rate response. And rate response accounts for uh, an accelerometer or some seismic, seismic mass in the pacemaker generator that when it senses certain vibratory frequencies, it elevates the base rate. So if you see a base pacing rate, and you know the lower rate limit is programmed at 60, but you're looking at tele and it's pacing the A at 80, 
you think, okay, rate response is programmable. There is fifth letters, which is the presence of multi-site pacing. This is not really used or relevant anymore. So just know these four chambers, pace, sense, response to sense activity, and then rate response or no response, no rate response. So assuming normal function, it's a good exercise to look at an EKG and say, okay, what is the, what could the pacing uh, programming B. So here is one such EKG. Um, so Marvin, what could this pacer program uh, uh, programming uh, settings be as far as the three letter code? Um, this could be, so I see pacer spikes before the P wave. Right. So you so. know, you know that mm -hmm. this, that the uh, first letter has Could to at least have uh, an A or a D. A or D. Yeah. And since there's some uh, uh, native P waves or a sense P wave, um, it the second um, letter could be A and D as well. It could be A or D, perfect. Now here you don't see any sensed activity, so you don't know if it's truly sensing. It could be not, not sensing any of that and just force ah. A, O, O, but it's true. So it could be A, B, or O. Yes. And then the second, uh, this, the third letter along your uh, line of reason would be either it's a, 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 a. yes uh, uh, sorry it's I T or D it could be any of those things because you don't see a response to sense activity you don't know what the response to sense activity it's a fun Absolutely. puzzle to play good perfect um, so what about this one uh, Mariana what what is that second letter so what is the second letter there and the third letter? I'm not. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking? Yes, I'm not sure. Okay. So the, what you see here is native P waves and ventricular pacing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, that it's, you know that it's able to pace in the V. So that first letter has to, be, has to include a v. v. It could include an A, but you don't see any pacing in the A. A, right. Um, and and so you know that, it, that at least the first letter has to include a V. But the second letter, the second letter is important. The second letter is sensing. You, here, you don't see any ventricular sensing, but you definitely see atrial sensing because the V spike is sensing the atrium. It's following each A, even this early A. So what's important here is that you know you have a wire you know you have a wire in the A because it's sensing the A, and you know you have a wire in the B. And then, of course, the third letter could be triggered, triggered. or triggered to the sensed atrial activity, or D, uh, dual, so inhibited or triggered based on, on sensed activity. So it's a puzzle to work through. I think it's fun. And you can, you can reason, you can, you can reason uh, why someone would have and advice before you're able to see the chest. Very good. Uh, more of the same, this shows response to sense activity, so you know this is AI. And then this one, assuming normal pacer function, assuming normal pacemaker function, and what is this uh, device program? Sorry, Dr. Lloyd, I think you had a question in the chat feature. I think, uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Chat, chat. Why do you know there's a wire in the A? Uh, Virgil, 
you know there's a wire in the A whenever you see sensing. So you see that the V is chasing the A. The V is reliably and predictably following each A. A sense event has to have a wire in it. So it's not just pacing that has to have a wire. If you see sensing, it has to have a bipole in the chamber. Does that make sense? Yep, got it. Thanks, Dr. Lloyd. Yeah. So what about this one? This is normal pacemaker function in the CCU. It's, it's hard, right? It's a mess. But what you can see if you look at the rhythm strip, you see it kind of an erratic uh, left bundle branch block morphology with sinus rhythm and pacer spikes are just marching through. So there is no sensing on this device, right? So the second letter is O, nothing. The first letter, the, pa the chamber pace, is got to be the V because here you see a V pace, here you see a fused B pace. So this has got to be V O O pacing. There's no sensing, which can be normal behavior in an epicardial wire that they're just cranked up. Now there's no capture here, right? We'll talk about that later. So the three commandments of pacing function, three and a half really, in order for a pacer wire to sense or pace in a chamber, it has to have, uh, in order for a pacer to sense or pace in a chamber, it has to have a wire in that chamber. So this is about device identification. Spikes with nothing after are failure to capture. So those stimuli artifact that are marked by the EKG or the tele machines, if there's nothing after it, that's failure to capture. No spikes or spikes in unexpected areas indicate the sensing problem. So if you see more spikes than you would expect, more spikes, that means it's not sensing events, that's under sensing. If you see fewer spikes than you would expect, that indicates an over sensing problem. And we'll go through a couple of examples. And then finally, you know, what you, when you approach devices, think of how people will want to program this and remember that right ventricular pacing in general is bad for a person unless it's, uh, unless it's a BIV. So if it's just a single uh, pacing wire in the ventricle, always try to avoid it. And the programming will try to avoid uh, ventricular pacing unless it's a BIV. So let's talk about identifying types of devices. This is the radiograph of a gentleman in the ICU. So what is this uh, AM? What type of device is this? And this is why I hate Zoom. Colin, what type of device is this? this is, these are softball questions. Uh, it looks like a dual chamber ICD. Why do you say dual chamber? I think I see an RA lead here. Well, that's don't I? no, um, you don't. But that's okay. That so yeah, it's an ICD. Why do you think it's an ICD? Uh, I see the thicker coils. <clears throat> yeah, there's the presence of high voltage coils. The presence of high voltage coils tells you that's an ICD lead. No pacing has a high voltage coil because it doesn't need to deliver a ton of current. Um, in a, a single pulse. So yes, you have your pacing bipole here. You guys can see my mouse. But these coils tell you it's an ICD. The de device generator is a little bigger. This is a dual coil system, call it a dual coil single chamber defibrillator, but there is no A lead. Maybe this slack kind of looks like an A lead, but there is no yeah, A lead. Yeah, I think that's what I see. That makes sense. Yep. So a dual coil defibrillator lead. Many Many uh, defibrillators these days don't have this SVC coil. They just have a single coil uh, because devices are so good at defibrillating that. But yes, and this is, this tells you how this patient is pro programmed, right? This is almost certainly programmed 
VVI 30. It doesn't want to pace the ventricle. This is probably a heart failure patient because he's got a defibrillator in the first place. And you don't pace the ventricle in heart failure patients, especially if they have sinus rhythm or, or a narrow QRS. So it's probably VVI 30 backup pacing with a VF zone or a VT zone. So the big can, the high voltage coils, usually VVI 30, VVI 40 is how they're programmed. What about this thing? Ahmed, what's this? Uh, looks like uh, there's a lead in the atrium. There's a lead in the ventricle. Correct. Um, so it looks like it's a pacemaker. Uh, looks like um, with the, again, with two leads in the atrium and the ventricle. Yeah, perfect. It's a dual chamber pacemaker. Dual chamber pacemaker. So you can think that this person either has, it's gonna require atrial pacing, or he could, she could just be a little old lady with heart block and they just put in a DDD system. So if there is pacing, a lot of times we'll program these things with a long AV delay. Why for the long AV delay? Because you don't wanna pace the ventricle if they have intrinsic narrow QRS. You don't wanna pace. So good, dual chamber pacemaker. This is, this is bleached, I'm sorry. This uh, shows a swan, an A lead here, which is always characterized by the hook, an RV lead here, and then this thing with no screw, this is a passive fixation lead out the coronary sinus. You see three pacing leads coming out, this pacemaker here, so this is a biventricular pacemaker. Bi-V pacers will want to pace the ventricle. So they will have nominally programmed short AV delays and always trying to pace the vent ventricles. This is in contrast to dual chamber pacemakers. This is a uh, senior fellow question. What is this? Uh, Nick, are you over there? Yes, Dr. Lloyd. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so looks like there's a um, there's a lead in the atrium, pacing lead in the atrium. There's a um, dual coil ICD uh, in Perfect. the ventricle. Um, this header looks a little tall. <laughs> right. So there's a. I'm not actually sure. Like you know, next to the generator, there is there. This thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm looking at. Is it is it something that um, like an epicardial implanted outside or? That's it. Perfect. It's an epicardial by V. Okay. So if an electrophysiologist fails to get in the coronary sinus, like at uh, Midtown, they'll. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, they will send them to the surgeon to put in the screw and lead. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is an epicardial lead. And this is very relevant because if they come to your CCU, Nick, with bacteremia, we got a problem. Because normally I'd say, okay, we'll extract everything. Uh, in this case, I can't pull that out. So uh, this is gonna be a problem, but good. So again, short AV delays. So you get the idea. And uh, some of you uh, will see this as well. This is a high voltage can under the left lateral thorax and a high voltage coil right along the sternum. This is a young congenital patient. And this is, of course, a sub Q ICD. The reason sub Q ICDs are important to identify is because, and the ER screws this up all the time because they say patient has an ICD, they must be able to pace somehow. This device does not pace, except uh, in the rare instance where it shocks somebody and delivers these high impulse pacing uh, for about 10 seconds. But this is a sub QICD that does not pace. So it does not pace. I'm sure many of you have seen these already. All right. So the other point I wanna make is that a lot of times pacing is 
when, when you get these outside referrals, pacing programming is not, uh, uh, it's just left to out of the box settings. So people will program it just not whatever the nominal setting was out of the box. And, and it's important to look at how the device is programmed and adjust it. And in this case, this person was programmed with uh, very high rates of DDD pacing, even though the patient is an AFib. Um, and we programmed it off just for backup V pacing at 60. So you see the single pacing spike. But remember, when somebody paces in the ventricle a lot, something happens. And look at the EKG on this. This is not normal, right? The T waves are terrible looking. The vector is pointing, the T wave vector is pointing uh, away from the feet, so towards the head, and away from the apex. So what is the, what, is, what accounts for these T waves? Does anybody know? This is called T wave memory. So after ventricular pacing uh, and you turn it off to allow for a nice narrow QRS, they will have an altered T wave vector just because of the pacing. And T wave memory usually points to the sky and it looks terrible. You'll see this on board questions after someone gets rid of an accessory pathway or someone gets their pacing, inappropriate V pacing turn off, T wave memory. It doesn't mean ischemia. Talked about this, we talked about this. What type of device is this? You have- IV. Go ahead, IV. Uh, I heard, I heard by V. You have short uh, AV intervals, and many times in by Vs, you're able to separate the LV and RV a little bit temporarily. So you have this little BV offset, and this tells you three pacing spikes. You couldn't get it any easier, right? You have an A causing P waves, and a B causing the QRS. So you know it's a problem. Good. So you get the idea. So that's all I'm gonna talk about as far as device identification. I have to mention briefly an important circumstance with DDD pacemakers and by V pacemakers. DDD pacemakers will react to A, right? And it'll trigger the V. That's part of the D on the third letter. But if someone goes into AFib, let's say this is a by V, Somebody goes into atrial fibrillation at rates of 300, and you have it. You have it. You have it. DD have it, D, D, D behavior. So this is erratic ventricular pacing at very fast rates, approaching the upper tracking rate, the upper rate limit of the of the ventricular tracking. And this is uh, inappropriate tracking of AFib by a DDD pacer. You do not want to see this. You will occasionally. Most, most devices now have an automated feature called mode switching. And mode switching is the simple uh, software algorithm that says, okay, if I see atrial rates that are above some limit, let's say 170 beats a minute, or it can be programmable, whatever you want it to be, it's going to say, I'm not going to chase all of those A's that I see at my upper tracking limit. Instead, I'm going to reprogram myself to DDI. So DDI, you're going to have no triggered ventricular pacing. You're only going to pace at whatever the base rate or the sensor, in sensor indicated rate is in whatever chamber. So it can sense in the A, and as long as it sees the AFib, it's just going to inhibit, 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 inhibit the A. It can sense in the V, and as long as it sees a V, it'll inhibit. It'll only pace. It'll only pace if it doesn't see uh, uh, sensed events. So it'll set, it'll tr just only pace at that backup rate. So this is called mode switching. You have to know about mode switching. But that's the only 
algorithm that you really have to know about, automated features. We'll talk about some others for the aspiring uh, EP fellows. All right. Sensing for pacemakers and, and uh, implantable devices. If you can obtain the upper and lower rate limits, because if you have those values, you'll know if there are too few or too many pacing spikes. Remember that more spikes than expected mean undersensing, less spikes than expected mean oversensing. Now, oversensing in an ICD represents a special problem because not only would you have inhibition of pacing, which may not be the end of the world, in an ICD, but you will have inappropriate shocks or inappropriate therapies. So what can happen in sensing? Let me get rid of my chat box here. You have a can, you have a wire, and in most systems you have a bipolar lead, which is a ring anode and a tip cathode. You'll occasionally see pacemakers programmed unipolar, which means it used the CAN as the anode. This is a larger antenna. And if you have unipolar sensing antennas, you will pick up uh, a, 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 broad, a broader EMI or uh, pectoral muscle myopotentials. You don't want that in a defibrillator because that would result in shocks when the guy's doing push-ups and uh, that would be a bad thing. So unipolar is not allowed in defibrillators, but is allowed in pacemakers. Bipolar sensing is better because it has a smaller antenna and limits the amounts of sensing of the extraneous noise and will only sense, uh, and will tend to only sense uh, intrinsic cardiac signals. So here's an asymptomatic 65-year-old DDDR program with a long AV delay. Here's the tracing, AV, A spike, B spike. What is the sensing abnormality here? Hey, Dr. Lauren yeah, Evans. Um, so it looks like we're uh, pacing A appropriately, but then uh, we're under sensing the V because it looks like they're it's the pacing spike after the, uh, the QRS complex. Good. So, the vent so it's ventricular under sensing because it's, it's supposed to see, it's DDDR, I told you, it's gonna be, so it's gonna be sensing in both chambers. But even though this ventricular spike happens, uh, this uh, intrinsic QRS happens after the A pace, the V doesn't see it and says, oh, I don't see a V, I better time out and pace. So this is ventricular under sensing, very good. So this is more spikes than you expect, perfect. So here is a defibrillator. So this is the surface. This is the this is kind of a far field EGM. And this is the EGM that's used as the sensing circuit in that right ventricular lead. Here's a marker channel. And whenever you get a printout, you can tell what you're dealing with. The computer will tell you what it's seeing, what it's seeing. Here's a pace, here's a sense. Here's a sense event very close, VF, VF. Here's a sense, VF, 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 sense. So what's the intrinsic problem here? Elena? It seems like it's not sensing the VF. That's, that's, that's right. That's all it is. So you know, you see in the RV and for God's sake, the surface, there's VF. This is not organized rhythm. And here you have uh, erratic variable amplitude EGMs, right? At a very rapid rate, but the device is only sensing periodically. So if it only senses periodically this VF, you get failure to shock and death. So for ICDs, 
Sensing is a big deal. Sensing has to be adjustable because VF isn't always going to be the same amplitude QRS like some sort of paste event or intrinsic event. Very good. This is another one, fatal undersensing of VF. Here's another one, fatal undersensing of VF in a sub-Q, where it periodically sees the tacky, 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 but then it's just sensing periodic uh, ventricular signals, but this guy is pretty much cold and dead at this point. Undersensing of, of uh, uh, VF by a defibrillator. So in pacemakers, you'll have a fixed line. We'll say nominally this pacemaker will be programmed at four millivolts. Anything that exceeds four millivolts on the sense amplifier will reset the clocks and say, okay, I see, I see that event. That's a sensed event. Whereas if you did this in a defibrillator and you just had a fixed value, even though the intrinsic sinus QRS may be really big at four or 10 millivolts, VF may not. And so that's when you run into problems. So defibrillators have an auto gain where the bar is reset after a sense of it and it'll slowly get more and more sensitive. That number will get more and more, uh, will reduce more and more as time goes on until the bar gets reset. So there's this auto gain feature of defibrillators. The sensing is really the tricky part for defibrillators because of this issue. Does that make sense? All right, let's talk about some more sensing problems. So this is a, a series of patients that we saw that would be getting shocked in the pool. So they were shocked in, uh, in, in swimming pools. You have an atrial channel, you have a ventricular channel. The patient is dependent on her pacemaker and you have what the device is doing. Any Emory Cath fellows want to take a stab at this? Why did this patient get shocked? Nice, all right. So the, uh, the reason is, Chaz, okay, chat here. Undersensing VF, undersensing VF, background noise. That's, oh, that was a new, okay. All right, good. So background noise, what do you mean background noise? You're right, it's noise. It's oversensing something in the V. It is oversensing. It's oversensing because there are fewer spikes than you would expect uh, uh, on, on the system. And it's saying VF, VF, VF. And then your eye can tell this is not real. This is a sine wave, characteristic sine wave appearance of some fuzz, some electrical fuzz. This is electric electromechanical interference, EMI, EMI. EMI is characterized by this sine wave appearance on numerous leads. If it were an intrinsic lead problem, guys, why would it affect several leads? If it's extrinsic, like from a chlorination unit in a pool that uses electrolysis, it injects current in the pool and it's got a little leakage current in it, it will give uh, a current to all of the leads, so it'll be picked up on all of the leads. So one of the tips is that if you see the noise on several leads, it's probably gonna be extrinsic. The other tip is the sine wave. The sine wave is from aliasing. So remember, you know, our mains outlets are 60 hertz. 60 hertz, boom, 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 60 times a second. The sampling frequency of the pacemaker or defibrillator is some frequency that's different, 50 hertz or some other frequency. 
And when you have offset sampling frequencies, you're going to get that aliasing, that sine wave. So that's why you know this is EMI from leakage current. Now, this EMI is only detected on the V lead, but you see it on both, right? You see the fuzz on both. It's really only detected on the V lead here as VF. Now, what happens? Why did this lady faint? She's dependent on the pacemaker. If it's seeing fake VF, it's seeing the fake news, you're not pacing. And so the patient fainted. And then finally, it satisfied detection criteria, and then it shocked her just to add insult to injury. This is from leakage current and swimming pools, especially those chlorination units, which inject current. Good. And that's the little uh, electrolysis thing. So be careful if you have a device and you have a uh, saline chlorination unit. So non-physiologic noise is from intermittent conductor touching one another from a loose set screw or a fracture. It can be from EMI, the thing I just showed you. It can be from skeletal muscle or physiologic noise, which is in blue, it can be from skeletal muscle or diaphragmatic potentials or intrinsic cardiac events such as T waves or QRS is that you can see the QRS from the A lead or the QRS is so fat that it double counts QRSs. All of these can represent noise. Recognizing the types of noise are important. Here's an 82 year old with a VVIR pacer, 60 to 130. I had her do uh, isometrics, the Suzanne Summers pectoral muscle uh, exercise, the pressing of the hands together. And when she did that, she went asystolic, fewer spikes than expected, over sensing of skeletal muscle uh, myopotentials and a very old pacemaker that is programmed to unipolar sense. So that antenna from the RV ring to the can is sensing those skeletal muscles and uh, inhibiting because it thinks it sees the, the ventricular beats. Here's another myopotentials. These are fine, high-frequency uh, uh, signals in a person who's dependent on their pacemaker, A pace, B pace, or sorry, A sense, B pace, A sense, B pace. Here's A sense, A sense, A sense. Noise from the person bearing down while having a bowel movement from the diaphragm. The lead picks up the diaphragm skeletal myopotentials. It calls it VF, causes a systole until the diaphragm stops uh, bearing down and then you have V pacing again. This is diaphragmatic myopotentials and it, the same is true for skeletal. It's a skeletal muscle, so you can have pectoral myopotentials. We used to call these cough shocks. Right? So you'd get shocked by their defibrillator because they're coughing because the, uh, the diaphragm's being detected. This should look familiar to you. This is an A channel, a V channel. You're seeing sine wave, that aliasing. You're seeing it on both channels. So this has to be electromagnetic interference from leakage current, either from a, a faulted toaster or a swimming pool, or whatever. So here's an EGM. Focus on this. This is a St. Jude, which gives these pixelated far field. Don't focus on the, on the second row. Focus on this first row. This is the nice EGM showing QRS, something else. QRS, something else. QRS, something else. And the device is seeing it as a signal, so it's calling it VF. And when it calls it VF, that can lead to inappropriate shocks. This is T wave oversensing. Remember, defibrillators have that auto gain where the sensitivity decays after it sees an event, and it decays so much in this case that it sends the T wave. So this will lead to double counting. And even though the heart rate's 100, it's going to count it as 200 because it's counting the T wave and the QRS, resulting in inappropriate shocks. The computer tells you what it's seeing. And if there's ever a question, you can 
follow the F and follow it up and see on the EGM what it's looking at. And if it's if it looks like some intrinsic cardiac event like a T wave, you know, hey, this is probably T wave oversense. Here's another sense, here's another example of oversensing. This is erratic high amplitude behavior, uh, uh, EGMs, very fast coupling intervals of, you know, less than 100 milliseconds here. This is conductor fracture noise, where the, the lead is actually physically broken and it's touching intermittently. This will, of course, lead to inappropriate shocks and failure to pace and all kinds of problems. This necessitates a fix. This was a case in 4G CCU a while ago where the device was programmed uh, at a base rate of whatever this is, 60, and we'd see this, a pause. They said, hey, why, why is the pacer not pacing at that, uh, at that base rate of 70? So whenever you see a pause like this, fewer spikes than expected, you could say, well, geez, all right, I know this is a case of oversensing, but why? And on telemetry, you can say, all right, I know the, def the base rate has got to be this interval between the two pacing spikes where you don't see the pause. So what you can do is march back from the, 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 the pacing stimulus after the pause, march back to that same interval and look and see what cardiac events are happening there. Sometimes you'll see nothing, which means that the device is oversensing some kind of noise. But sometimes it'll fall exactly on some, some other intrinsic cardiac event, like a T wave. So in this case, the pacer is being reset because of T wave oversensing on the part of the ventricle. So that T wave tells the ventricular channel, oh, I saw a, a, an event, a V-sense event, PVC or whatever but it's really a T wave, resets the clock, and then that's what results in the pause. So you can always march back and work your way backwards too. Dr. Lloyd, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, yes. In that previous, you know, how this would be different from the MVP Metronic when it doesn't pace for a little bit and wants to see if there's a, um, intrinsic conduction? Well, the MVP Metronic Remember, Nick, it, it allows for atrial events without ventricular. So if it would have to see an A, it would be an A event. There would be an A event with no conduction. That's right. So I'll, I have those on the back, um, but that, that's why. I that's see. why. Okay. There's no intrinsic atrial event. Occasionally, you guys will see this. It's intermittent noise. Um, it looks junky like conductor fracture noise and they want us to extract the RV because it's broken. So the question is, would you extract this? Lead, is the lead broken? Patient is fine. It's not had any problems. I think you see some noise in the atrial lead also. So I think it's something probably external. Fair. Thank you, Evan. Uh, that's right. So it's not just on the V lead, it's on the A lead. And even though it doesn't look like that classic EMI for the sine wave, which is from mains leakage current, you, you have to worry that this is some sort of intrinsic noise. And in fact, this is. And this is exactly what bovine noise looks like. So the patient had a carotid endarterectomy and they didn't know the patient had a device. This is bovine electrocautery noise. And the tip was that, as Evan said, you see it on more than one lead. So you know it's EMI. So no, you would not extract. You'd yell at the surgeon for not knowing. This is a patient of Dr. Vegas when we had 4B. This is a defibrillator, single chamber, ICD program VVI 40. To the Grady Fellows, is this under sensing or over sensing?
Come on, Grady. Not that Grady, but it seems to be oversensing something and trying to pace it out. Very good. So this is the one exception to my rule that more spikes than expected represent undersensing. But this is a defibrillator, and this pacing isn't base pacing. Uh, this is uh, anti-tachycardia pacing. This is therapy. This is ICD therapy. So you're exactly right. There's a lead that was broken during an uh, LVAD that resulted in noise and triggering the device to anti-tachycardia pace. Oversensing in an ICD. Very good. All right, enough of sensing. That's going to be your main issue. Uh, capture issues are rare. This is going to be pacing spikes with nothing after them. There's not really too much to talk about. This is a lead problem. Uh, here's an example of a DDD pacer. Uh, pro, well, it might be VVI. It's not looking at any Vs, is it? At any rate, it's intermittently capturing the ventricle and occasionally missing. Luckily, the person has an escape. Uh, this represents an output problem. It's either lead dislodgement or you just need to jack up the pacing output. Remember that I showed you this VOO pacer, this VOO pacer, uh, where absence of sensing, absence of sensing can lead to functional non capture. This lead captures just fine. But if the V is paced in a refractory period, like in the ascending limb of the T wave, you're going to have functional non capture. That's not the pacer wires problem, that's the ventricular. Uh, myocytes being refractory. So this is functional non-capture. So you can also see this. This wouldn't necessitate reprogramming of pacing output. It would necessitate reprogramming of sensing. So they're, they're dependent upon one another. Good. Grady got it right too. Thank you, Grady. No microphone. The only capture issue that I want you to know about uh, as we wrap up here is the following. So this is a 71 year old with a, uh, uh, an implantable device who has worsening dyspnea and a dilated cardiomyopathy. And what I want to point out is that this is AV pacing with short AV delays. So you know, you know what kind of device this patient probably has. So here is the most common scenario for ventricular non-capture. So what is the problem here? Zakaria, so please tell me you have a microphone. I love how people can, can hide. How about RAM? This we all have to know. What's the problem here? No mic, RAM. No mic, but morphology does not, not look by V pace, good. So that is exactly right. So you have a QRS vector, uh, and you have a QRS vector that's positive in limb lead one, and negative and V1. This is all coming from the right ventricle, RV apex, probably the inferior RV apex, and that's the key. So the LV leads are our bugaboo. They are the hardest and they all frequently have higher pacing thresholds or dislodge because they're passive fixation. They're the problem. So all we did is increase the output on the LV lead. Now you have a narrower QRS, you have negativity in limb lead one and positivity in B1, positivity going towards the sternum, applying a vector from somewhere in the back, like the LV uh, back wall going forward. This is uh, by V pacing. And this is the one capture issue that you're gonna have to be uh, aware of uh, and recognize on the boards. 
So remember that bottom final thing is pace morphology consistent with bivy pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And the key is a positive vector in B1 towards the sternum because you're depolarizing some of the ventricle from the back and negativity in limb lead one. You can have one or the other or both and that be indicative of bi pacing. It's unusual to have neither and have bi pacing. It can happen in abnormally situated hearts, but it's unusual. The most common consult you'll get uh, is the pacer isn't acting right. And most of the time, uh, Langberg used to say 99% of pacer malfunction is a lack of understanding on the physician's part. I'm not gonna get into specialized features. I made part of my publication career from this. There are a hundred of them. Uh, Nick mentioned MVP. Uh, there are a, a bunch that will go over when you do your EP rotations, uh, but remember that they exist. And most of the time, pacemaker malfunction is pseudo malfunction from these automated features. Here's some of them. They're mind numbingly boring and detail oriented and device de dependent, just know they exist. So the points I wanna remember is that normal function uh, of a pacemaker and what type of device is the most important step to any type of troubleshooting for the device. We talked about x-rays and intuiting pacer programming, and we talked about uh, figuring it out from the EKG itself. When lost, go back to the basic, those three commandments, of malfunction that we talked about. And most malfunction, remember, is not true malfunction, but some automated reprogramming that the device has. Know when they exist and know uh, to ask your EP fellows or us uh, to troubleshoot if, it, if it's something just isn't, isn't adding up. So with that, uh, there are a bunch of backups about uh, MBP, as Nick mentioned, and some other things. Um, for the super nerd, nerdy pacemaker types, but uh, that's where I'm gonna end. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.